Welcome back to the stage, Helen S. Cohen and Mark <laughs> Lipman, the makers of this gem of a film. Is this a gem or what? Hey, you guys. We are going to... Um, I'm inviting you after the feature film, which will be up in a minute, to meet um, Helen and Mark out in the lobby for more questions and more questions with the maker of the feature. But we want to flow right into the feature, and we've got a short period of time, so I'm going to usurp the uh, question asker role here. And um, the first question I wanted to ask is, you know, music and singing is such a big issue in this film, and it really reminds me of um, our art and the role of art in social movements and the art of filmmaking. And I was just wondering, how did you get Charles Sherrod to, to sing like that? Um, well, there's, there's a long story, and I'll tell the short version of it, um, if I can, which um, the, there was music all the time, and there was a lot of singing. There was a lot of singing in the, the fields when we were there, and, and we were actually just there for two days. All of this was uh, shot in southwest Georgia in over a couple of days, but there was one moment where we were, we had actually been setting up for Shirley Sherrod's interview on the porch and then realized that we had to move inside and it was this whole kind of chaotic thing and we were resetting up inside this, um, this house, one of the cabins on that plantation, and I was standing out on the porch um, hanging out with Charles Sherrod and along came this guy named Emery, and they just broke into song, into this beautiful ballad. And um, meanwhile, Rick Butler, I'll give a shout out to him, our DP, local, uh, wonderful cameraman, um, and Mark was the sound recordist. Uh, they were inside setting up, and I'm standing there listening to this going, oh my God, you know, we have to, we have to get this. And I asked Sherrod when he was done singing, I said, w could you guys just do, I mean, I sort of had to get up a chutzpah to ask them, you know, would you, sing this again, and I went and grabbed Rick and grabbed Mark, and we came out, and uh, they just did this beautiful ballad, um, which became really the centerpiece of, of, well, the opening and closing of the film, but it, it kind of grounded it in that uh, spiritual musical um, element, which is incredibly important to the whole story. It's really beautiful, and which reminds me, you wanted to sh do some shout outs to some people who are here. Gus was the mayor of Berkeley for eight years, a while back, and has been involved in community development and land trust work for many, many years, and was really pivotal um, in helping us to finish, get the film finished at one point. Um, so, and hopefully he will be in Berkeley uh, on the 4th. Actually, I'll put in a plug for that. The film's going to screen again August 4th in Berkeley, so please let your friends know and encourage them to come. And the, the, just the two other quick people. So John Davis um, is uh, credited as our co-producer, and it was he was really the, the the brainchild and the guy that got us to this phenomenal story. Um, he's in Burlington, Vermont, but he he was just um, a key player in the making of the film. And then I just want to share a little quick anecdote or or a shout out to Alonzo King, who you may have seen in the credits, and some of you may know him as a local cultural treasure, um, Alonzo King Lines Ballet, but. Uh, about halfway into the production of this film, after we had shot it and um, were, work were in the editing room, we found out, reading the fine print in some historical document, that he turns out to be the son of Slater King, who was one of the founders of New Communities. And uh, we had this incredible kind of reunion of, um, with Alonzo, and uh, he ended up giving us a lot of the photographs, and um, he was just blown away that we were making this film, and um, it, it turned out to be a really uh, wonderful uh, partnership and, and friendship that developed out of that. So um, the arc extends all the way here to San Francisco from, from Georgia. I know, Mark, you are really an, an expert in land trusts. And I was really moved by the line in the film that all power comes from the land and the land comes from God, which is different than another quote, all power comes from the barrel of a gun. And it <laughs> really made me think about it. Where do we stand with land trusts in the country, in the cities, and particularly with, I'm also struck by that statistic in the film of how much land African Americans lost. Can you talk about where we stand with that and even any ideas of people getting involved in that movement? Thanks for that question. And um, you become sort of an amateur expert anytime you make a film. But um, 
there are about 250 community land trusts in the United States, and it's also become an international movement. You may have noticed in the credits that there, are several, there were several funders uh, from CLTs in uh, London, England and Belgium. Um, there are CLTs in Australia now, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a growing movement. And one of the reasons we wanted to make this film, which is actually one in a series of short films we're making about community land trusts, was to support the work of, of this movement, because it's, it, it's, it, it's an unusual model, and it goes against a lot of the ways uh, that land ownership is structured in this country. So uh, we, were, we were really hoping to create media that showed the positive use of land trusts and could encourage policy changes and that could support this. Um, there's a, actually a consortium of uh, land trusts in the Bay Area called the um, Bay Area Consortium of Community Land Trusts. Um, and um, and there are, you're right, there are land trusts in San Francisco and in Oakland. The Oakland CLT is actually an outreach partner for this screening. of CLTs easier and we, I mean, we don't have grants and that happens and we want to make it easier for them. Yeah, I know here in the Mission District, a land trust bought out the Pigeon Palace, which was just right over there on uh, Folsom Street and kept that so they can be um, a tool in this issue of gentrification that we all face as well, I think. Yeah, and also just, I mean, the foreclosure crisis and the economic crisis that hit was certainly another blow. I mean, the, the black land loss has been a, a theme for many, many years, but um, communities of color are certainly hit the hardest by um, all of these, you know, bank foreclosures and, and um, other, and racism and redlining, and I mean, the list goes on. And so, um, you know, there, this is really a story about um, permanently, you know, cr trying to create permanently affordable housing and dealing with land, and it's also about racial justice and uh, economic justice becoming a very central part of the racial justice uh, movement. All right, well, we're gonna continue the conversation with Helen and Mark after we see a new color, The Art of Being Edith Boone. And what's really exciting is we have Edith Boone here in person, Please stay, she's gonna be up on this stage to talk to you after you see her on the big screen. We're also gonna have the exceptional filmmaker Mo Morris to talk with us, and also Allison Elgard, who is legal director of the Equal Justice Society, which is doing fascinating work with both litigating and using art for social justice. So, let's watch another film. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.